So as many of you know, additive manufacturing is capable of making uh, final production parts, a variety of different types of parts, using a variety of different materials. Uh, but given these advancements, there's kind of now a key consideration that needs to be made, which is just because something can be made with additive uh, doesn't mean that it should be made with additive. And the should we're really getting at today are the economic considerations. What can be cost effectively made with additive manufacturing? If you identify the right parts, you can certainly save literally into the millions of dollars, uh, but you need a structure to find these parts. And so today we'll, we we'll be presenting you with a framework to help identify parts that are commercially viable for additive manufacturing. And we'll also be going over a couple of case studies detailing some of these results. So real quickly, Brendan covered most of this, but about uh, Senval. So I'm Zach Simpkin. This is Annie Wang. We're both the co-founders of, of Senval, as Brendan mentioned. And we're both MBA graduates um, from the Wharton Business School. So everything that we do focuses on the business implications of adopting additive. Our core expertise really lies in helping companies analyze um, how the implementation of additive can drive business profits. Because at the end of the day, we believe that's really the most important uh, the determining factor. Um, we've worked with a variety of Fortune 500 companies over the past few years in industries such as aerospace, uh, oil and gas, consumer products, and automotive. We've pre presented at a few trade shows um, and, and industry conferences. And we also authored a section of the Wolders Report this year. And some of what we'll be going over today um, kind of echoes what we wrote about in the Wolders Report. So if you want more detail, I'd, I'd recommend uh, purchasing the report. Um, so many of you work for organizations with tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, or even millions of SKUs. And that's a daunting to think about. You know, how do you go from this huge number of parts and figure out which parts are commercially viable for additive manufacturing? And so we've identified, uh, through our work, seven supply chain scenarios that tend to lend themselves well to additive. So I'll go through the scenarios. And the parts that fall into one or more of these categories may be cost effective for additive uh, and may be worth taking a deeper look at. For parts that do not fall into any of these categories, uh, they almost certainly will not be cost effective for additive. So here are the scenarios. The first is expensive to manufacture. You've likely heard about this. If you've got a part with complex geometry that's you know, time consuming to machine, it may be expensive to machine, that's something to look at. Uh, the next is long lead times. That's pretty self-explanatory. High inventory costs. Uh, sole source from suppliers is something that not a lot of companies think about. So if you have a specialty machinist that makes a part for you, uh, you know, what happens if that machinist goes out of business or is acquired by your competitor? If it's going to take you six months to qualify a new machinist, uh, that's a huge risk to your supply chain. And so qualifying a part for additive uh, prevents you from having this risk. Uh, remote locations, obviously there are logistics uh, benefits to additive. Um, high import and export costs. And lastly, improved functionality. So this is situations where you can redesign for additive um, to you know, create basically a part that couldn't be made uh, previously. And sorry, last thing I wanted to say about this is uh, the key to these seven scenarios is that, you know, when you think about additive, it's not just a manufacturing solution, but it is a supply chain solution. So additive can benefit all these different factors within the supply chain, and they all need to be looked at, not just the cost of manufacturing a part, but the entire supply chain. And so at Senval, what we've done is we've developed an algorithm that determines what types of parts can be more cost effectively made with additive versus the status quo. And our algorithm doesn't just look at the cost of the part itself, but it analyzes the entire supply chain. So it includes secondary costs such as downtime, opportunity costs, shipping costs, inventory, carrying costs, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and again, it analyzes the entire product life cycle. So there are sort of, there are four modules to the algorithm. And so the algorithm looks at costs associated with design, costs associated with manufacturing, costs associated with the supply chain and logistics, and all the way through to costs associated with spare parts and obsolescence. So now we're going to go over two case studies to show you kind of detailed results. Uh, the first is a, a cost-effective use case, and this is for GE. So this is where uh, an example of switching production to additive saves the manufacturer, in this case GE, saves them money. And then we'll juxtapose that against a case study uh, that was not cost-effective. Uh, so this was for Johnson Controls. It was actually with Brennan. Um, and it was a case where additive was more expensive than the status quo, which is not really the interesting part, but the interesting part that we'll show you is we show why additive was more expensive in this case, and what we'd need to change for additive to become cost effective for this type of part in the future. But we'll start with the GE case. Um, so real quick overview is for their measurement and controls division, the part measures uh, 5 by 5 by 9 in centimeters, and they, they currently uh, machine it in an aluminum alloy. 
And the part, uh, their customers require custom variations, so no two customers uh, order the exact same thing. Um, and this speaks to what Brett was talking about earlier with, with customization. And lastly, the volumes were, were very low. Uh, some customers on the low end will order just a handful of parts, and on the high end will order uh, several hundred parts. Uh, the benefits, again, we were looking at is a reduction in manufacturing cost, and also there was a consideration of eliminating component assembly. The part was currently machined in five different uh, components and assembled together, but added it was able to print the part in, in one go. And so this falls under the expensive to manufacture scenario. Uh, that's what this particular case study is showing. So the algorithm looks at three uh, situations, three scenarios in this case. The first was analyzing the status quo, which is what they're doing today, machining. And then we compared that to an AM metal process. And so when we say AM metal here, that's a specific process with a specific machine and a specific material. We unfortunately can't disclose the specifics, uh, but it was specific. And what was interesting also is that the part, although it was a metal part, was able to be made in a polymer. And because they were, GE actually redesigned it using geometry, the polymer part uh, met all the mechanical requirements of the machined metal part, which was pretty interesting. So here are the results. We'll get into the details in the coming slides. But what our algorithm does is it sets the status quo to zero um, here. And then it shows the delta between the status quo to the other scenarios. So the AM metal process was $100,000 on average more expensive than the status quo. And this is net present value over 10 years. Um, but the AM polymer process actually saves GE $100,000 over that 10 years. And you know, $100,000 for a company like GE really isn't all that much money. Uh, but this part was a proxy for many other parts. So as you begin to apply this analysis to more and more parts, uh, the savings begin to aggregate. So I don't know if those of you, some of you in the room may be familiar with Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, our algorithm is driven a lot by Monte Carlo. And what that allows us to do is account for variability um, of the inputs. So every input that goes in, you know, for instance, lead time, you could say it's two weeks. Uh, but the reality is it's never, you don't know exactly what these inputs are. You know, maybe sometimes it's 10 days, maybe sometimes it's three weeks. So Monte Carlo allows us to account for variability of all of the inputs. And so it provides a much more realistic output, which is a range of possible outcomes with different degrees of certainty. So in this case, a metal is around, you know, $30,000 to $180,000 more expensive at the 90% confidence level. So with 90% confidence, we can say additive and metal will be more expensive. Uh, and, and conversely, additive and polymer at the 90% confidence level uh, will be less expensive. And so GE has a very high degree of certainty that switching production to additive polymer process in this case will save them money. This is a, a grossly oversimplified view of what our algorithm is doing. So it's, it's taking a bunch of inputs around cost and ordering, and then the output is the total cumulative cost over the 10 years in this case. So we'll start, we'll start by looking at the cost. So this is looking at the additive metal process. And so in this case, uh, the print bed could fit 16 parts in a full print bed. So at 16 units, if they had a full print bed, the cost would be $400 per unit. And again, this is for the additive metal process. But if they were only to make one part, which is very inefficient, uh, the cost would be $1,500 for that one part. And then the curve is just a best fit uh, based on the polynomial equation. And on the right, it's showing the same thing, but again, using Monte Carlo to show confidence bands. This shows the number of units being ordered. So one unit, two units, three units, so on and so forth. And the fourth column over shows the additive metal cost per order. And this shows the traditional cost per order, which is the machining cost per order. And the, the big takeaway here is even at 16 units, which is a full print bed for additive, so even at its most efficient, additive metal in this case is more expensive than machining. So the additive metal order would be $6,600 compared to the machining of $5,700. Um, and so additive and metal, again, is not cost effective in this case. But the story begins to change when you look at the polymer. So the polymer costs are lower, not surprisingly. In this case, a full bed of 16 units was around $200, uh, but one part was only around $750. And here's where it get, gets interesting. So if you look at one unit, if a customer were to order just one part and they were to print one part in polymer, uh, the, the total cost for the additive process in polymer would be $950. Uh, but the machining cost is only $500. So for one unit, machining is actually still less expensive. And at around eight and a half units, there's what we call an inflection point, And that's where additive starts to become less expensive than machining. So if you look at the ninth row here for nine units, the cost for additive is $3,200, but machining is $3,300. So for nine or more units, additive and polymer is less expensive than machining. And so that, that could have been the rule of thumb. For nine or more units, you go with additive. For eight or fewer, you go with machining. But GE uh, further complicated things, and they decided that they were only going to go with one process. So they were only going to always machine it or always go with additive. 
And it complicated things because there was a great deal of uncertainty in this case around the orders uh, in, in, in two manners. One, they had no reliable way of predicting when orders were coming in. And this was important because they weren't going to batch orders together. And the second consideration was they had no good way of predicting what the size of those orders would be. So one week they might get an order for just three units, and the next week they could get five orders for 100 units each, and they had no clue. And this was important because if they were going to go with additive polymer process and they weren't going to batch orders, when an order came in for only one unit, if no other orders came in, they were going to have a very inefficient print. It was going to be very expensive. And so we needed to factor that in. And our algorithm uses um, stochastic demand forecasting to capture all of this. And what this is showing is just the total cumulative expected orders over the 10 years. And so it's expected to increase over 10 years, but also, not surprisingly, as you project into the future, uh, you become more uncertain and the confidence bands widen. So going into the total cumulative cost, this is kind of showing again what we showed at the beginning, which is that the additive polymer process is less expensive than machining, which is less expensive than additive and metal. And the additive polymer, again, will save on average around $100,000 net present value over the 10 years. This is uh, what Monte Carlo also allows us to do is show sensitivity analyses. And so this is showing GE what's driving the overall variability of, of, of this uh, situation. So what's driving this variability? How can we make this a little more certain? So in this case, the number of orders per year is driving 50% of the overall variability of total costs. So if GE wanted to become a little more certain about what the outcome would be, they now know which variables they should focus on and which variables they should put a little more time into understanding so that they can make the overall total cost more accurate. Uh, so the summary of this case study is, again, GE saved $100,000. They were able to focus on the most impactful inputs. Um, and we don't have time to go over it today, but we algorithm provides uh, output that helps them decide whether to go in-house in with production or whether to outsource to a service bureau. And just to recap, once again, tying it to the seven supply chain scenarios, this was an expensive to manufacture scenario. And what we're going to show you now in the second case study is a part that didn't fall into any of these seven scenarios and therefore was not cost effective. And Annie will walk you through the second case study. Thanks. So in this case study, we actually looked at a, uh, a part from Johnson Controls Automotive Division, and we worked with uh, Brennan on this. So this part is about 8.2 cubic inches, and currently it's injection molded in polypropylene, and Johnson Control requires about 8,500 of these units per year, which for 8,500, that's fairly low for the automotive industry, but you can expect that's fairly high for additive. Now, we all knew going into this that this part was not going to be cost competitive against injection molding. So the real reason was why and what needs to be changed. So the goal was to determine which inputs, and by inputs I mean is it material, is it the machine price, is it the annual services fee, et cetera, that is having the greatest impact on the cost of additive. And for those variables, which variables need to improve and by what magnitude in order for additive to become cost competitive against injection molding? So we looked at four scenarios here. Uh, scenario zero is continue with injection molding. Scenario one is, for one, two, and three, it's all additive SLS process. We actually looked at two machines from 3D systems and one specific material, which is the Duraform. Uh, scenario one is the S-Pro 230 machine, which is the very large uh, SLS machines. And for that, you can make about 60, uh, 60 of these parts per, per print. Scenario two is the smaller SLS machine, which you can only make eight of these parts per print, which means that you actually needed five of these machines to get the quantities uh, that you require per year. And scenario three is we actually went out and got some quotes from service bureaus because we wanted to compare the price of additive in-house versus additive uh, from service bureaus. So here are the results. It's pretty shocking. $2.64 for injection molding and you can see all the other additive is significantly more expensive, with the most cost competitive being the SLS polymer and the, um, the S-Pro 230 at $39.42. So let me show you a little bit more detail about the, the, this cost structure. These bars are showing per unit cost, as in each of these, each of these parts. Injection molding is very low here, over here, $2.64. You've got S-Pro 230 in this column, the Pro X 500, and then finally the service beer, which is the most expensive option. And each of these colors correspond to the
the contribution of each of these variables. So the dark blue represents the contribution of material cost. The lighter blue represents the contribution of the annual services fee that you're going to have to pay on the machine. The, the green, for example, represents the AM machine cost, as in you have to buy the machine. So, so given that additive right now is not cost competitive, we wanted to take a deeper dive into why. And here we see injection molding is $2.64, the S-Pro 230, which is the most cost competitive in this case, at $39.42. We wanted to see, for all of these variables here on the left, if we improve each of these variables one by one while holding all of the other variables constant, what would happen to unit price? So take material price, for example, $2.50. If you improve material price by 10%, i.e. you go from $2.50 to $2.25, that's going to drop your per unit price from $39.42 to $36.76. So that's just changing material price while keeping all of your other variables constant. Now what this heat map is showing is that the red is showing the variables that had the greatest impact on additive cost, and the green is showing all your variables that have the least impact on additive cost. And you can see that the top three are material price, the part volume, and the cost of the AM machine itself. But even if you improve material price by 90%, so you're dropping from $2.50 to 25 cents, the part price only comes down to $15.44, which is not even close to $2.64. So the takeaway here is that for this part, in this particular case, not one variable is preventing additive from being cost competitive. In fact, you have to have all, many variables improving to, to, def, to, to, to different levels in concert in order for additive to become cost competitive against injection molding in this case. So obviously the next step is to see what would happen if we improved multiple variables at once. And so what the algorithm starts to do is to, is to generate a multitude of fictional scenarios where we're improving multiple variables to, to, to varying levels of improvement. So here's one example of one fictional scenario. Uh, your AM machine cost improves 30%, so it goes from $780,000 to $546,000. Your AM machine life improves by 50%, so it increases from seven years to 11 years, et cetera, et cetera. And if all of this were to happen, then the improved additive cost per unit becomes $2.63, which is a penny better than injection molding. Now, this is just one of the many fictional scenarios that we've generated. Uh, here is another one. But you can see that if you look at the improvement levels, you can see that everything is a trade-off. So in one fictional scenario, one variable improves more. And in another fictional scenario, the same variable will improve less. Now, whether or not you believe that these improvements would happen is another discussion. But what it is doing is that it's helping a company like Johnson Controls plan for the future. So you know the answer is and additive doesn't make sense now, but the point is when will it make sense and what needs to happen for additive to make sense. And so it allows a company like Johnson Controls to now track the most impactful variables, such as the machine cost and the material price, and possibly work on redesign to change the part, uh, the part volume, uh, and track that over the next however many years and determine at what level should I now start planning for additive for my organization? So we'll just wrap things up real quick with a summary. So you know, given current technology levels, some parts are cost effective to produce via additive. And the key is finding the right parts. And again, the best way to start from a huge number of SKUs to start narrowing it down is using the seven supply chain scenarios to start categorizing your parts. Uh, for parts that are not currently cost effective for additive, generally speaking, there's not one variable that is preventing additive from being cost effective. It, it's usually many variables uh, that will need to improve for additive to become cost effective. And our algorithm can construct the scenarios, the fictional scenarios that Annie just went through uh, to help determine when a part will become cost effective. Um, and again, this is generally speaking, but the most impactful AM variables on total cost are, they're often material cost, the part volume, and the additive machine cost itself. And the last thing we want to leave you with is kind of taking a step back 
And so uh, for business considerations overall with additive, you know, identifying parts and running cost benefit analyses is certainly a very important business consideration that you need to make. But there are other considerations, many of which are being talked about in the other sessions that we just want to highlight uh, will impact your business. So, you know, obviously you need to educate your executives, the C-suite, and all employees really on additive, the industry, and what it's capable of. You want to analyze the supply chain process. So even if you're going to switch production to additive, you know, do you go with distributed manufacturing or do you go with production in a single location? Uh, next, you know, connecting to industry stakeholders is key, which is, you know, a good reason to be here at Rapid. Uh, just walking the show floor, meeting the machine providers, material providers, 3D scanning companies, software companies, knowing all these companies and how they fit together in the industry uh, is pretty critical from a business consideration standpoint. Um, and lastly, strategizing for future, future iterations of the technology. So in the case of Johnson Controls, the technology may not make sense today, uh, but you want to understand when it will make sense and be prepared to take advantage of it and leverage it when it does make sense so that you don't fall behind your competitors. Um, so with that said, we thank you very much for your attention and we'll open it up to any questions.